Welcome to Reaching Abundance. I'm Virginia Elder, your host. This is the podcast where you get weekly cliff notes on developing mental fortitude and podcast marketing strategies from top business owners. Ready to level up your show? Start by booking a call with me using the link in the episode description. Let's get into the episode. This week on the podcast, you get to meet Audrey Kwan. She helps agency owners stop drowning in client work and build a service-based business that can scale. Audrey's focus is on creating strategic systems for your business, helping you implement them, and guiding your steps into the leadership role you've been craving. Want someone who knows agencies inside and out to help you scale to seven figures? Audrey is your gal. Audrey, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me on your podcast. If you could just start out by telling us your own personal definition of abundance. My definition of abundance is it's not necessarily about dollars, although I own a business and of course I know in a business making money is important. And it's not necessarily about even having a ton of like free time to do whatever I want. Like that's great to have in my business, i.e. I have the weekends, I have the night times, I have the amount of time I need in my business to do the things that are outside of my business. But true abundance to me is defined by having an impact and doing meaningful work. I want to have a positive impact on as many lives as I can in a way that honors the amount of free time that I want in my business, as well as meets the revenue that I want to generate so that I can take care of my family. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get different takes on it. And I wonder if it depends upon where a person is in their life journey, like which life stage they're at. For the most part, I see this common trend of we all want to feel relevant in some way. And that could be to our audience. It could be to our families. It could be to like a social impact level of feeling um, like we're making a difference in people's lives. So share with us how your business is around helping agencies scale well. So talk to me about the impact that you're able to make and kind of how you chose this as a profession. I feel like I was raised in agencies. So it's really natural for me to own a consulting company uh, that helps agencies leverage systems and processes and leadership so that the owner can really get back more time. It makes sense because when I say I'm raised in agencies, I think if you haven't been in an agency you might not understand how an agency is structured. And so when I first entered the work world, which is right after college, I entered an agency as like an assistant and then I became a coordinator, then I became a manager, then I became a director. So I was really raised in agency environment. That's how I really came to choose my niche because that's what I knew. But how I got to owning my own business is a absolute different story. I had worked in agencies for a really long time and then I had gone what's called client side. So client side is working for the clients that hire the agencies. And the agencies that I were working for at that time were serving like Fortune 100s and Fortune 500s. And so I went client side, so to the client. And I really thought that, hey, that was going to be my life. I was going to go work for the clients, build their teams and climb this corporate ladder. Guess what? It didn't work out that way. I had a like an awakening moment. Uh, I, I think I call it now an awakening moment. Back then, I would have considered it more of like being hit by a bus. But <laughs> but um, you know, 12 years into my career, um, one day I got a call from my mom and she was uh, in Toronto. And Toronto is a, a city in Ontario in Canada. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. And I got a call from my mom and she's like, hey, I'm not feeling really well. I need to come back from this trip that she was on. And I said, okay. She had said that physically she wasn't feeling well. She took a plane ride in, she flew back, and the very next day she went to see a doctor and went to the hospital. 
and she checked into the hospital and she never checked out. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and passed away in three weeks. Wow. Yeah, that was my wake up moment. I say that because yeah. I wished a lot of things for her. Like She was this busy person. And to be frank, she was not always very present. You know, she had her brain on other things. It could have been work. It could have been multiple other things. She thought about work just all the time and, and she never took vacations. And then when she passed, I, I thought to myself, what do I wish more for her? Like, I wish she lived more of her life. Mm. I wish that she had the right systems, the right leadership in place that taught her how to better manage her personal life versus her work life. Yeah. Really, I just wanted her to have more freedom in her life to enjoy it before she passed. And and so she was really the inspiration for starting my business. Mm -hmm. The niche in itself was because it's a field that I know. My mom was really the inspiration for wanting to build a business that is really about helping agency owners build their business in a way more sustainable way that gives them more freedom and allows them to have more time with their family. Mm -hmm. That's how this business got started. I, so I did finish a master's degree in organizational development. So I'm in communications focused on organizational development before I left my job. But one of the things that I did that I don't necessarily recommend for everyone is I finished the degree and I just quit and started a business. <laughs> and I, I say that because I did use my life savings to do that, right? And I think anyone who starts a business knows that I would say the first two years is a huge learning curve. Mm -hmm. It's one of the biggest learning curves you'll have because I think there's the excitement of starting the business. There's the excitement of making a change and a difference in the world. Those are great and those get you to the end of the day. But what we don't know, and I think as a person starting a business, I knew that it was going to be hard. I just didn't know what those difficulties look like and simple things like even getting a website up was something that just felt like a lot of work right because you didn't know what you were doing at first I was like this is easy and then you gotta figure out oh, wait I've got to understand the messaging oh wait and there's the design but even simple things like that right just getting it off the ground the first two years was most likely the hardest thing there was those things like website but more so there were things like getting clients mm -hmm. I say this all the time I think all it takes is one great client, especially in the service-based industry. So I'm a service-based provider. So we do consulting and we do coaching. And so all it takes is one client and serving the client really well. Yeah. And then one becomes two and two becomes four and four becomes eight and, and off you go, right? So I would say like, yeah, that if I were to look at kind of my journey, mm -hmm. that would be the short of it. Yeah. Thank you for telling us about your mom. And I'm so, so sorry. And I could definitely see how that would be just this life-changing, very fast window of time that completely changed your perspective. So before that happened, did you see yourself almost like accidentally following in her steps where you would just be busy, 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 like absent-minded, never take vacations? And then that really not only changed your perspective of what you wished for for her, but then you're like, oh, I have to change the what I'm doing and then that's why you opened your business yes the scary part like the awakening moment was looking at the life that I was creating for myself and seeing how much of it wasn't what I wanted for myself mm -hmm. and how much of it was me following an example of how I thought it should be to be fair yes the example of how it should be, or I thought it should look like, did look a lot like how my mom was currently at that time living her life. Mm -hmm. Not to say that she was a bad mom, no. I, I, she did the best that she could, but the reality is I was following an example. And I think when she passed, and she passed so fast, the first thought that I had was, what happened? <laughs> like, what what just happened? And why? why? I think it's, it's natural for us to ask why. Mm -hmm. And the why was connected to, I think, the health that she really gave up when she was just so focused on her career, so focused on work. And the other part was, I think, her not knowing. Yeah. And maybe maybe she did know. Maybe she did know that there, there was a consequence to those actions, but I don't think she knew there was any other option than what she was doing. 
right? And I feel like my business right now and the people that I consult with and coach with, that's what, you know, I, that's what we do. We go in there and show people there is other options for how you run this agency. It isn't just the way you're doing it right now. There are different ways that we can run it and things we can put into play that will give you just more freedom, things that you can learn that will help you and other people lead better so you can step away. I think those are the things we talk about a lot when we work with people who have a business that is at capacity and growing and you know they don't want to give up the business. They want to continue pursuing the success of the business, but they also want to have their life along with that business, right? And when I look at my mom and I look at me and the path that I was leading then, I also didn't know that I could have both. I, I really felt like, okay, well, if it's all in on this career, it's all in on this career and there's nothing else. Yeah, and I think whether it's accidental or not, the concept out there that's talked about all the time is like kind of a joke. Like people play it off like, oh, well, you'll work 40 hours a week for somebody else, but you'll quit and start your own business and then you'll work 150 hours a week for yourself. Ha, ha, ha. And then a lot like paired with that is this narrative of the first few years are so hard. That's where you put in the most of your hours. You're DIYing everything because you don't have the capital to fund outsourcing. Like, you know, like you said earlier, somebody to build your website for you so that you're not doing it. And there's different hurdles that you have to tackle within those first couple years. So there is a lot of language out there that almost makes it acceptable for newer business owners to just work themselves to the ground during their quote unquote startup phase. And that startup phase is not defined. It could be a year, it could be five years. And you can look up and say like, why am I still working so hard? Why has this not figured itself out? Why do I not have a big enough team yet? Why, why am I still afraid to hire? Or like whatever the question is, but I think it's so easy to kind of get lost in that language, believe in that language, and then live through it, and then get used to just kind of the head down grind to where you do look up in five years or however long, right? Past the time you should. Yeah. <laughs> to realize, <laughs> why am I still doing this? So that's why, um, well, for one, I noticed on your site, there are a few of my friends, beautiful faces in your testimonials. So that was really exciting for me to see. And your whole site talks about your Mighty Pod model, which is an amazing coaching program. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that and like maybe why you created that program? Yeah. So the Mighty Pod Agency, or we also call it the Mighty Pod Model, is a structure that we help agency owners build in their business. Our ideal client is a small but mighty agency, which is also the name of my podcast. Mm -hmm. And let me just put it this way. So when we think of small business, I think out in the corporate world, a small business is like 50 people and under. Yeah, small but mighty agency is not the 50 people when I say small business. Really, a small but mighty agency is about 20 people. That's a small but mighty agency. And typically, when people come to me, they sometimes want to build agencies that are even smaller than that. Mm -hmm. And it could be a five people agency that they want to build, right? The goal is with the Mighty Pod model is we help you build the agency that is lean enough to get you to the revenue that you want. So this is not about building an agency that is bloated with a lot of people. It's about understanding what's the revenue that you want to hit in your business and what's the leanest team that we can create to help you get there. Have you ever pictured yourself hosting your own show? Maybe it's time. This show is edited and produced by podcastabundance.com. And if you like what we're doing, we'd like to do it for your business too. I'm Virginia Elder, and I've been helping entrepreneurs and business owners launch and grow podcasts since 2019. I coach you through branding, establishing structure and workflow, and recording your episodes. Then my team and I professionally edit your audio and video so you don't have to. We'll even write your episode descriptions and titles so that when potential customers turn to Google, your show appears in their search results. 
Establish authority in your niche, expand your reach, and create a library of helpful content for your potential and current clients, all with your own podcast. I'm here to hold your hand and make podcasting the exciting, up-leveling experience it should be, skirting you past the tech and software struggles. Take the first step by booking a call with me using the link in the show notes or by visiting podcastabundance.com. Now, on to the rest of the show. The Mighty Pod model is about, number one, identifying the niche with which your agency can serve. And I'm like a broken record when you talk about niches because I think if you want to grow a small business, you have to have a niche, especially especially if you want to grow a small business that is sustainable and doesn't have you working like, you know, 100 hours a week. Because mm-hmm. when you build a niche business, you save yourself a lot of time on many things. And the Mighty Pod model is about building a niche agency business that saves you time because when you build a niche business, the second pillar is productized services. So productized services is taking what you do, i.e. the processes that you take to implement the work, i.e. for client delivery, and creating a product around it. that And that just means the processes that you can use repeat over and over again to implement the work. So prioritizing your services, right? The third pillar is, obviously, after we have the prioritization, after we understand the processes, it's building your team, right? Looking at the structure of the team to run the business at Salinas and looking at the right people to bring in. The agency model is very different than other models. For example, I think, Um, there are a lot of people out there who say, okay, well, if you hire a OBM or an online business manager, it should solve all your problems, right? And I will tell you that in the agency model, that's not the case. And I have people come to me who are like, I tried having three VAs. I tried having, you know, an OBM and it didn't work. And it didn't work because in the agency model, yeah, there are a few things have to be put into place. That is your productized service. That is your process and systems that fit an agency model and then the right structure to help you run the work. So that's the third pillar. The last pillar that we look at is always marketing. So when we talk about marketing, any business needs this fourth pillar to thrive. And so we look at what does marketing for an agency look like? And you know, marketing for an agency looks very different than marketing for other business models, right? Some other business models require the person to be a content creator to run that model, but an agency model, it actually looks very different. And so those are four pillars. That's what the Mighty Pod model or the Mighty Pod agency is about. The niche, the productized service, and then the team, which is the pod that we build out, right? And then it's about marketing. And we call it the Mighty Pod model because once you figure out what the core pod is to run your productized service, we replicate the pod so you can scale the business. And we can replicate the pod as many times over for as big as a business you want, or we can stop, right, at a certain size and a certain revenue. So that's the Mighty Pod model. Yeah, I love that. And I think... It's so easy for someone to start a service-based business, do it all themselves, then start to figure out like, oh, I need a graphic designer. I need so-and-so, whatever that role is to help because I am working too much. And you start to assign these roles to people and you're growing because that does allow you to have some more capacity, but you're still the bottleneck as the owner and as the person who like has their hands in everything. So what I was really attracted to was kind of your idea of those individual pods. Maybe you assign clients to those pods and you can duplicate them, like you said, and you're no longer the bottleneck of your agency. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is that for a long time, I had a really, uh, basically an aversion to calling my business an agency. I had heard so many complaints about, I don't want to hire an agency. You know, I, I worked with an agency and they didn't do what I wanted, whatever, like all this bad rap type of stuff about agencies. And so for a long time, I just stayed completely away from that word. Tell me what you know (laughs) from being raised in agencies all of this time and working with agency owners. How do we avoid that reputation in the marketplace? Not just for our own business, but if you hear somebody saying like, oh, like I don't want to work with an agency again. 
what can we say? What can we do? How do we reverse that type of thinking? First, I gotta say, you are not the first person to say to me, oh my gosh, there's this reputation that goes with, with the word agency. You're not the first person to say that. And mm. there is that reputation when someone works with an agency that is not living out their values. It makes me sad. It makes me sad because just like any other industry or any type of business model, there's always going to be someone who really cares and someone who doesn't, right? Like, like any yeah. industry. And so it's sad for me to hear that the word agency has this bad connotation because I truly believe that if you want to have a business that cares about people, then it's your job to build it into your processes and your systems. Mm -hmm. That's why I care about processes and systems because your values need to be built in there. And the first thing is understanding what the values are and how that translates into your business. Mm. Let's say, for example, you really value communication, right? Transparent communication with your clients. How are you building that into your business? Mm. Does that look like consistent meetings with your clients, consistent being maybe they're biweekly, maybe they're monthly, but what's the agenda for that meeting, right? That's a system that you need to implement, right? It's not just, well, I had a meeting with the client monthly and our value is transparent communication because we got into call with them, it's transparent. No, right? Your job as the owner is to say, what does transparent communication look like in our monthly meetings with the clients? What are we going to talk yeah. about? And how is every person in our organization who's running these meetings meeting that objective through these meetings that we're having with the clients, right? So if we want to look at an agency that lives to its values, you got to look at what are the values how are the values being implemented through your systems and processes? And then looking at do those actual things you've built in systems and processes deliver for that client on that value? Mm. We're always then looking at if it delivers, great, how do we improve? If it doesn't deliver, okay, this is, we need to get rid of this and add something else in here, right? So again, like any business, if we want to build a business that is about serving clients better, and better can be defined by your industry, by your business model, because it could mean better can mean different things across different businesses. But if you're an agency, if better means client communications, if better means delivering on promises, if better means making sure that you know, your team is accountable to promises, then you've got to ask yourself what actually exists in your organization to do that. Right, what processes? That's me on my high chair talking about you know what it takes to deliver a, a business that is value driven. Yeah, that's super helpful and really can make any owner, whether they are running an agency or whether they refuse to call it an agency or not, really think back about like how are we doing things? Why are we different? And how do we? build processes, like you said, to emulate those values and make sure that that's carried through, whether I'm the one overseeing this work or not. That key right there that you said about building processes around your values. So not just the standard operating procedures of how to do a graphic, right, or how to produce a podcast, or even more minute, like in my agency, we have processes around my expectations of the audio that I'm listening to after it's been edited, like what I'm listening for. But beyond that, like you're saying, how are we communicating and running those meetings and all of those things? I think that's super valuable information there. Thank you. I think it's a misunderstanding to think of processes as just and sure, of course, process is about the day-to-day -day how to do something like you just mentioned, right? How do you mm -hmm. edit a podcast episode after it's done? Sure, that's a process, right? But I think when you, when you think of processes that create true sustainability in a business, you're looking at things like a metric that we should always be looking at is called retainment. The retainment is MRR, right? So your uh, monthly recurring revenue. And if you retain people, your MRR increases month over month, right? And that's how we create what we call a sustainable agency. Yeah. If your goal is retainment, then you need to identify what creates retainment in your agency and then look at the processes that continue those practices for your agency. When we think of processes, it just isn't about how, hey, how do we get this graphic out the door onto social media or how do we design this website? 
true processes and systems actually look at the goals that you're trying to achieve in the business that relate to sustainability, like retainment, identifying what creates that and creating good processes around it that your people can run so that, you know, when you take off on vacation, your business doesn't fall apart, right? Because that's what real sustainability is about. Yeah. And I think more often than not, if I talk to a business owner that's within their first, let's say, five years of ownership, that is what they're trying to figure out. Like, how can I take more vacations or a vacation? How can I schedule in the time to actually be with my kids on spring break or something about that kind of leave of work without the panic of, is the business okay? So aside from processes, creating your pods correctly, are there any other key tips that you would want to share with business owners about being able to build in that time off? Yes, you can have the best processes and the best systems in your business, but a business doesn't run without this one thing and it's called leadership. Leaders, i.e. people, run processes and run systems. Right. And sure, we can talk about what AI can do in the future and all those good things. But the reality is you still need people in your business these days to run a servicing business that has to meet with clients, connect with clients, talk to clients. And so I would say that one of the key skills, I think, especially like you mentioned in the first five years of your business and wanting to step out and take your vacations, take the one month off, you know, go on spring break, all those things, it requires business owners to level up their leadership skills. And, and that's one thing that I think we don't talk about enough when it comes to building a business where you are not the bottleneck and where you can have time off. Absolutely. Well, and I know you have a free resource for download. I totally snagged it as soon as I saw it. It's your free Mighty Pod model cheat sheet. So that gives us like the quick kind of rundown of some ideas of maybe what we should be implementing in our business. Do you have any other resources or like recommendations of leadership development, something or another, like maybe your top recommended book or something like that for an agency owner? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, right now with the leadership support that we provide, it's actually inside the Mighty Pod models. Awesome. So typically when we look at niching, productization and structuring the business, we go, then go into marketing and all of that looks at how are you leading the business at this moment in time. Let's hop over and talk about your podcast. It is called Small But Mighty Agency. I love it. It's very bingeable, interesting and fun. And I feel like it's like a no fluff instruction set of information for agency owners. So I really appreciate that. What made you start a podcast for your business? You're already a business owner. You're trying to have abundance in your life in whatever definition that means to you. And then you're going to start a podcast. So how, how did you decide to do that and still make it to where it, creating a podcast didn't take over your life? The first time I heard a podcast, I thought to myself, like, wow, this is great. I can plug something in my ear, go for a walk mm -hmm. and get all this information, right? While I'm multitasking, I thought this is wonderful. And the first thing I ever did was download a whole bunch of podcasts and listen to people who were sharing their stories and sharing, you know, their, their advice. And I love podcasts. I think that's the first thing that is required. I think you have to love podcasts in order to have a podcast. So I would say that, you know, that's part of the decision making process. The number one that was most important to me was I, I really did enjoy the actual channel in itself and mm -hmm. how I could multitask and get information and, and learn. When I started to look at my business and again, my definition of abundance is to have more impact and do more meaningful work. And I felt that the podcast was a place for me to do that. If I were to look at my goals, which is to have more impact, do more meaningful work, yeah. the podcast would allow me to reach more people. There are so many different avenues that you could use to reach people. You have to look at what you like to do. I do not like to dance on Instagram reels. So that's not my thing, right? 
I don't see myself being any sort of a, a YouTuber, at least not in the near future. And so I just looked at all the, the marketing channels that are available. And one of the things that you and I talked about, Virginia, is that when we make decisions to launch something in the business, like a marketing channel, such as a podcast, it has to connect back to our work. Mm -hmm. So as entrepreneurs, we think about the time we spend on things and we think about obviously what the output is, i.e. the results of that art, and is it worth it, mm. right? And so the podcast was one of those avenues where I thought, well, I don't like doing Instagram reels. That's really not who I am. I don't see myself on YouTube, right? I do like LinkedIn and I am on LinkedIn, but I feel like it was hard for me to get my voice out on LinkedIn in a way that allowed me to speak for like, you know, 12 minutes <laughs> long and my episodes are largely when their solo is 12 minutes long when their interviews are 30 minutes mm. and so that was the second criteria for um making that decision it's just this was the right marketing channel for me because it fit who i wanted to be in the world mm. the third decision factor i really wanted and i think this year the the podcast has changed a bit into being a lot more solo episodes in the beginning, it was a lot more interviews. I really wanted a channel where I could get to know people, chat with people, meet people. Mm -hmm. The podcast was a great way to do that. Right? It was a great opportunity for me to say to someone, hey, you've got something really interesting that I want to learn more about. But you know, I'm not asking you to share it just with me. Let's go share it to the world and get you some visibility out there. And you know, people were more than willing to say yes to that. And you know, it satisfied my curiosity about them. It helped other people learn from them. And again, it met this criteria of mine, which is have more impact, do more meaningful work. Right. And what more yeah. meaningful things can you do than to interview people, talk about their experiences, share their experiences, and have other people learn from it. Right. So I think those were like the three big criteria that it met for me to launch my podcast. I, I love what you said about understanding that, yeah, there's work in a podcast, right? That when you decide to put out a podcast, mm -hmm. you understand that it's a commitment that you made. I wasn't blind to that either. I knew when I was going to put together this podcast that there would be a commitment that I would make. That's one of the I wouldn't call it a challenge, but one of the things that across the three years that I've had this podcast, I've realized having a podcast is really about making a reoccurring commitment every week or every other week to, you know, come showing up for it. Yeah, That's one decision factor that I kind of knew I was making, but didn't know I was making. And I just wanted to put that out there, you know, for anyone who's thinking about doing a podcast consistency is key and that's what you're signing up for right consistency in uh in this marketing channel yeah and thank you because if you kind of back into that a little bit consistency is what you would want if you said okay we're gonna take up xyz marketing endeavor it could be ads it could be billboards it could be anything right consistency in that would be what you would want. So why would it be any different if you're taking on a podcast or a YouTube channel or social media, like however you're choosing to do your marketing for your business? More often than not, people get tangled up in this concept of, oh, I'm gonna launch a podcast and I'm gonna have thousands of listeners and that will attract thousands of people into my business and I'll have all these clients and I'll be a millionaire, right? Like it doesn't <laughs> work that way. And yes, you could get there eventually, right? But you also, the same way you build an agency, you don't attract in massive amounts of clients right away, kind of on purpose, because that would be a complete disaster because you don't have the team processes, all that stuff. So many times it's a great thing for your podcast to be small and for you to build up that audience slowly. Mm -hmm. You've had your podcast for quite a while now, three years, I think you said. How did you get past that notion to look at metrics or judge yourself as far as like, oh, only 30 people are listening, you know, to my episode two. <laughs> mm -hmm. That will to just keep on going. Did you ignore the metrics? Were you meticulous about it and made tweaks to your show as you grew? Like how did you stick with it with those metrics 
kind of always in the back of your mind, like bothering you. Mm -hmm. Okay. As an entrepreneur, metrics matter to all of us, right? We're always looking at the metrics, but I, I knew from the very get go that I'm not going to push record and then upload this episode and bam, I'm going to have, you know, 5,000 listeners download this thing. Like I was very realistic about the outcome of that first year. Mm -hmm. And I think being realistic about it. And when I say realistic, it didn't mean that, okay, I I didn't have a goal for it. I knew off the bat for the first year that the win was going to be interviewing people and having the podcast as an opportunity to meet more interesting people. Mm. Every time I met someone that was interesting, I was like, okay, this is a win. But here's the thing that, I, that I've that i shared um, with others too who have started podcasts. It's this. In that first year, of the people that I've interviewed, more people came and interviewed on the podcast became clients, more than I thought would. Mm. So it's not interesting, right? So for me, when I interviewed someone, I never, first of all, there's no bait and switch here. It wasn't like I was going to interview them and sell them on being a client. I got to right. say that. That's not the goal here. It's not a bait and switch. But really, when I interview people, I really got to know them. And sometimes we have to look at our own strengths and understand what those strengths are. And I will say this, like mm-hmm. my episodes are, like you mentioned, very fact-driven, very to the point. And part of that is because I actually am a very private person. So I actually don't like to tell the world about my relationship with my husband or, you know, my family or or any of that, right? And so that's why my podcast, when it's solo episodes, is very fact-driven and gets to the point and gives a lot of like, here's what you got to do. But what I'm really good at when I get into conversations with people is really listening to what they have to say, pulling out key things, and also helping them while we're doing the interview. Mm-hmm. I'm not against sharing my thoughts or advice on something in a you know interview on a podcast. And I think because of the way that I'm built, my strengths, that creates a special relationship with the person I'm interviewing. And that also has, has led to a lot of people I've interviewed become clients. Yeah. I knew when I looked at the data from that first year of doing the work that, okay, this might not be getting 5,000 downloads. Yeah. That's not the goal. <laughs> and that has never been the goal. But here's this result is coming out of it. And does that result benefit my business? Hell yeah, it does. Right. And so, of course, I'm going to keep doing it. So I would say, you know, that that's the number for me. It's like the key thing. Get clear on why you're doing something and be realistic about what the outcome will be in the first couple tries, in the first year even. Mm-hmm. Look at the data. And we say, look at the data. Don't just look at the number of downloads. Evaluate what good is coming out of that, in this case, that podcast. And is that good coming out of the podcast worth you continue doing it? Yeah. That's the evaluation metric I use. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that because being behind the scenes for several podcasts over many years now, most people don't hit these big download numbers until they have 60 or 70 or more episodes published and out there. And even sometimes those 60 or 70 still take time to build up traction. There's 52 weeks in a year. So that is over a year of consistent weekly podcasting before you have this big audience, right? And the other thing I always go back to is like, let's just realistically look at your business and say, how many clients do you really want right now? If that number is like 10, 20, 50, you don't need 10,000 people listening to your podcast. You need like a hundred or two that are really in love with you. And that's all you need. And you can build out your business, whether it's a product-based business, service business, agency, whatever type. And so, yes, getting super clear, choosing the metrics that you're going to look at and why they matter, and then being really clear about how this podcast is driving business and how many clients do you actually need or want out of your show. So let's stay on that for just a sec. Tell me how having a podcast as your marketing arm for your business has contributed to your idea of abundance. You know, I'm thinking it's bringing in clients, it's bringing in money, it's creating some lifestyle for you, but could you expand on that for us? 
yes, like we just talked about, it brings in clients, right? But in a in a way that was very unexpected in the beginning. And I think now it's, I haven't been doing as many interviews on the podcast, though I will be returning to doing more interviews in this latter half of the year. But I will say that in the beginning, it was getting clients by having more conversations with people. But as the podcast has, you know, we're in our hundredth plus episode now. I have people that come to me and say, hey, I've binge listened to like, you know, six of your episodes before I connected with you, right? And I, I see the podcast as a nurture vehicle in my business. Sure, I may still interview people and they still over time become clients. But the other benefit of having a podcast that is 100 plus episodes is that people can come in, listen to one episode, hop around and then come back and say, oh my gosh, like I got a feel for you. I know you, which, you know, it, it's always surprising every time I get someone who gets on a call with me and is like, I know you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know you, so let's get to know each other first. But I'm so ecstatic and so grateful that they listen to more than one episode to get to know me and feel like they can connect to the way that I deliver value, mm -hmm. right? Because again, the podcast is representative of me as a person. I, like, like I just shared, I might share tiny little bits of my personal life in there, but I don't spend 15 minutes talking about my personal life. And some podcasters do, and people who listen to those podcasts really love that. I can see how that can work for many people, but my comfort zone is not there. And so typically when I get on there, I get straight to the point. And I think a lot of people that I work with appreciate that. Yes. You can see it in the consulting and coaching with the idea as well too. People get a flavor for that. And because they get the flavor for that, when they come work with me, they're not surprised that I pretty much get straight to the point when we're working together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the power of a podcast. I agree. I got that from your show too. And I thought, okay, this girl is like, no BS. Let's like dive in. Let's take care of business. And yeah, there's like a personality type there, I think, as well, that appreciates that versus maybe some other personality types want to talk about the weather. I don't know. <laughs> but for sure, that's not me. I'm like, let's get to the beef. So thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us today, talking about your podcast. I will definitely be putting links to your podcast, to your free download in the show notes. Audrey, thank you. Thank you, Virginia. It was a pleasure. I'd love to hear which piece of this conversation meant the most to you today. Head to reachingabundance.com slash convo. If you're ready to market your business effectively with a podcast, let's talk. Click the book a call link in the description and I'll take it from there. Thanks for listening to Reaching Abundance. I'm Virginia Elder, and I'll be back next week with another insightful episode for you. Follow me on Instagram at Podcast Abundance to stay connected in the meantime.